Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at spin one half. It's a particularly simple example of a finite dimensional Hilbert space, which we've encountered in the previous two videos. So spin is uh, a quantum property, which is also known as intrinsic angular momentum. So if we think kind of classically for a minute and think of the electron um, in the atom as like the Earth orbiting the sun, so kind of orbiting like this, uh, well, that has angular momentum, but you can also have the Earth spinning on its own axis, and that's what intrinsic angular momentum is like, okay? It's like the Earth spinning on its own axis. But things are obviously going to have to get a little bit weird, because while the Earth has a finite radius, the radius of the electron, as far as we can tell, is effectively zero. So we can identify properties of the spin of an electron uh, using what's called a stern gerlach apparatus. So it's an experiment that was carried out uh, in 1922 originally, I believe, uh, and it looks something like this. That is, uh, a, very, a large um, magnet, we've got the north pole up here and the south pole up here, this is somewhat schematic, um, uh, and in particular the apparatus generates a large field gradient in this direction. So we have a gradient um, of the magnetic field B directed in this direction. Now. Um, the electron, if it has this intrinsic angular momentum, if it's spinning, well, it's, it's got an electric charge, um, so we might expect it to have a, a magnetic field. And we can shoot a beam of electrons down through here. I think this was done by uh, just taking a heated element and, and it will emit uh, electrons naturally. And we can shoot our beam of electrons down through here and they'll deflect uh, in the direction of the gradient. So classically, if we have a screen over here, or some kind of measurement device for measuring where the electrons land, classically we'd expect some kind of spread that would look like this. And this would all be filled in. So it spreads out left to right just because there's going to be some natural spread of the beam. Um, and in the uh, top-bottom direction, the uh, electrons are being separated according to the projection of their angular momentum along the field gradient direction. So if the, uh, if the electron happens to be spinning at 90 degrees to that field gradient direction, it has no magnetic field in the direction of the gradient, uh, and so it won't accelerate and will get it into the middle. And uh, on the other hand, if it's completely lined up with it, either along or against the gradient, uh, it'll go to the top or bottom and we'd expect it to take any value in between. But what they found when they did the experiment is that it didn't look like this at all. In fact, the spread looks like something like this. That is, every electron either goes up or down, um, and there's nothing in between. It's quantized. This is a very clear example of the quantization of quantum mechanics, recalling that uh, quantum means discrete. So it seems that uh, Whenever we measure the spin of the electron along any direction, uh, it always takes one of two values, and those values are either plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. So plus or minus a half uh, in units of the reduced Planck's constant h bar, uh, and so the electron is what we call spin a half. So we can deduce various things from applying these schoen gerlach apparatuses to beams of electrons. Uh, here are the experimental observations. Taking our stern gerlach apparatus, um, we can place a block in front of one of the two beams. So, for example, we could block off this beam down here, and then we'd be guaranteed to have um, spin plus a half, or what's called spin up, uh, in this direction. And let's define this direction to be z uh, in this case. So, stern gerlach apparatus has a, a direction in which it's going to split the beam. Um, and by blocking one of the paths, we can guarantee that our electrons are spin polarized. Uh, in this case, it would give us spin up. We could also choose the spin down direction. So we make the following observation. Measurement of spin yields the values plus or minus h bar over 2 only. Consecutive measurements of the spin in the same direction yield consistent results. So if we pass this electron beam selected out as plus h bar over 2 in this direction through a second stone gerlach filter, uh, in the same direction, we'll, uh, all the electrons that get through the first will get through the second. Similarly, if we um, put a second one in the same direction and we block off all the ones that have plus h bar over 2, only allowing the ones with minus h bar over 2, none will get through because uh, we'll get consistent results. However, 
Subsequent measurement in a perpendicular direction yields either the value plus or minus h bar over 2 with equal probability. So that's the, the real clincher here. Um, if we measure it in the spin in z, and then we pass our spin polarized beam plus h bar over 2 through a measurement in x, uh, we'll have equal probability for it to be plus a half or minus a half in units of h bar. But that's really weird because that means if we perform a measurement uh, on uh, in the z direction, and then we perform a measurement in the x direction, and then we form a second measurement in the z direction, say we get plus h bar over 2 in the first measurement of z. Whatever we measure in x, we select one or the other of the two spin uh, polarizations in x, and then we pass it back to another z filter. Well, it said plus h bar over 2 the first time, but this time it has a 50% chance um, that any electrons coming through this to this have a 50% chance of giving h bar over 2 and a 50% chance of giving the opposite. So by making an intermediate measurement in a different direction, we can actually change the answer it gives in the z direction. And that's one of the fundamental weird things about quantum mechanics. So we're going to take a look at a demonstration of that in a separate video. Um, for now, let's just notice that there is some precedent for this in classical mechanics. If you think of, uh, let's take a spinning uh, classical object again. If we say this has some angular momentum uh, in this direction, spinning like this, and we also want to say, so this is some well-defined value, and I can work out what that is. Um, but if I also wanted to have a well-defined uh, angular momentum in this direction, but it's got to spin like this and like this. So now, what is its spin in the first direction? Because when it gets down to this, it's now spinning like this, and so now it's got zero angular momentum in this direction. Um, but as it spins back around to here, then it's now got the opposite of what it had before. So it's become time dependent. So there is some classical precedent for, for this weirdness. Um, but it is ultimately a fundamentally quantum thing, spin, uh, and it's very weird.